I have a question to ask. How many of you saw the play Wicked? Oh, quite a few of you saw the play Wicked. Uh, I did not know what Wicked was. It was the occasion my daughter was about to turn 16, and a few months before she had said, Dad, I would like to go and I would like to see this play Wicked. And I was like, well, can we even see a play like that? I mean, even its name sounds kind of wicked, you know, and I, I go, we are not the wicked type of people. I'm, I'm hoping not anyway. But anyway, she says, oh, Dad, it's not like that. It's not anything bad. It's, uh, it's the story of what happened in the land of Oz before Dorothy, uh, you know, came into the picture. Well, we went to see the uh, play, and as you you watch it, you begin to realize there was a whole lot more on the front side of the Wizard of Oz than what any of us would have ever suspected. And, and for a moment, you realize that Dorothy was really just part of a much bigger picture. And I really think that that's where Jesus is leading us in the Sermon on the Mount, especially as we get into Matthew chapter 6, that he's calling us to remember that, that while it, sometimes we think the story is about us, and when you go through our life and you're thinking, what do I need to do to get ahead? What do I need to do in this? That really the story is not about us. That really what has happened in the story of God is this, is we have, been play, we have been called to play a part in his story. And we have, for a moment in time, been called to be a part of a story that was going on long before we got here. A story that will go in, be going on long after our physical death. And for a moment in time, we get to be a part of the story of God. Well, that leads us into our uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're calling it Upside Down Kingdom. It's based on that first and most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave. You have heard it called probably the Sermon on the Mount. And as we're diving into Matthew chapter 6 today, you remember the story is given in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, the, that's the, the whole narrative of what Jesus is teaching. And Matthew records it for us. But in the days of Jesus, when Matthew was writing these words that there was no Matthew chapter 5, and there was no Matthew chapter 6, and there was no Matthew Matthew chapter 7. Those verses and the, the chapter numbers were given to us years later so that you could find it. So that if I said, hey, turn to Matthew chapter 6, you wouldn't have to start at the beginning and read all and try to figure out where in the letter we were. Those were added for our convenience. But as you'll see as we go through this, when Matthew wrote it, he didn't stop at Matthew chapter 5, that last verse, and say, well, close of the chapter. I'll start Matthew chapter 6 right here. It was just one continuous letter that he was giving us. And if you remember, Jesus has been teaching teaching throughout the cities of Galilee. He's preaching in their synagogues. He is healing all types of people. He's called Peter, Andrew, James, John, those people that we know as the apostles who would be those 11, those 12 who are following him you know, most of their life and you read their stories on throughout the New Testament. There are other people besides those guys following him. There are people from everywhere primarily following him because of the miracles that he's been performing and the things that he has been doing. And they've come to hear a message that that he is teaching. Uh, so you got people there that want to be healed. you got people there who are trying to hear this message. And the message is about a, a coming kingdom. It's about a Messiah. It's about the reign of God and the rule of God. Well, they've been looking for a Messiah. They have been looking for someone to usher in this rule of God. And the miracles that Jesus is doing is only giving the people of his day uh, affirmation that he has the power and the authority to do what he's saying. And he's describing in this message that he leaves for us what citizens of this kingdom of God look like. The first part of his teaching, if you remember, is called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes give us a list of characteristics when you're describing these people who belong to this new kingdom that God is establishing. Well, what do they look like? And he begins with a word called blessed. And then he gives the, the description. Blessed are those people, and he says poor in spirit. Those people who mourn over what sin has done to the world. Those people who have hearts that are pure. Those people who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Those people who live for peace in a world of war. And then he kind of ends that description with, with something that doesn't sound very blessed when you first read it. He says, blessed are those of you when people talk about you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely because you belong to me. And then he goes to why they are blessed. How can a people like that be blessed? And he says these words in Matthew chapter 5 verse 12. You can rejoice and you can be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven. Now, when we were in Matthew chapter 5, we really didn't talk about that re word reward as much. And what you're going to find as we move into Matthew chapter 6, that this word is going to come into play. That as we become a people who learn to live out the kingdom of heaven, what it means to live that out on earth 
Jesus is going to start talking about rewards. He makes no apologies for letting us know that there are rewards for people who, who live like the Beatitudes. For people who mourn over their, their sin. For people who make for peace in a world of war. For people whose hearts are pure, who have no agendas, who, who aren't trying to push themselves to get ahead. There are rewards for that. And then he kind of classifies rewards. We're going to see there are rewards in heaven and there are rewards on earth. And the question that he's going to ask is which reward are you after. Well, as Jesus begins to, to, to pour out these beatitudes to him, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, they love their enemies, they're willing to be persecuted. To those people, he says something to them. He says, you are the light of the world. <laughs> you need to know that. You're the salt of the earth. You are the people that, uh, that when you think of salt of being a preservative, you are here to preserve the flavor of what God tastes like to this world. They're going to see and they're going to taste that God is good because you live this way. And he says, and you are the light of the world. Just like a city that can't be hid. He said, you transform the darkness. You light up any place that you walk into. That's who you are. And then he makes a statement, if you remember in Matthew chapter 5 uh, verse 20, that really becomes the hinge point for the rest of his sermon. Not only the rest of Matthew chapter 5, but really the rest of Matthew chapter 6 as well, especially the first 18 verses. The, uh, the statement Jesus makes is this, now to you, you being again the, the people who had decided to follow Jesus, add to, the relig to anybody out there, for you, I'm telling you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, well, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I know I've said it before, but uh, everybody would have been confused by that statement. The common people would have been, well, we can't be as holy as they are. I mean, look at what they do. Look at all that stuff that's out there. And the people who were the religious leaders, they are thinking, well, that's impossible. They can never be as holy as us. One group is confused. The other group is com uh, offended kind of over Jesus' statement. And the rest of Matthew chapter 5 from that point on is Jesus giving six illustrations of what he means by that. Six illustrations of what he means by your righteousness must surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he gives big illustrations. He doesn't go with little things. He goes with murder, adultery, divorce, revenge, swearing, how to treat your enemies. And all of his illustrations will begin with something they had heard. Heard. And he will say to his audience, you have heard that it was said X, but I say to you Y. He says, you think that righteousness is don't murder, but I'm going to tell you righteousness is don't hate. You have heard that righteousness is don't commit adultery. I'm going to tell you that righteousness is don't lust. You have heard that righteousness is don't break your word, especially if you swear. I'm going to tell you righteousness is don't swear at all. You say righteousness is get even. I say righteousness is turn the other cheek. Forgive. Be givers. You say righteousness is love your neighbor but hate your enemy. I say righteousness is love both your neighbor and your enemy. You say righteousness is what you look like on the outside. I say righteousness is who you are on the inside. And then there is a shift in Matthew, from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 6. And the shift is this. All of these six illustrations are things they had heard that the Pharisees and the teachers of his law were teaching that day. And Jesus says, let me tell you what was really meant. The next three illustrations that he's going to give in Matthew chapter 6 are not about what they had heard them say. It was about what they saw being played out in the lives of the religious leaders. And all of that comes into play. What I'm going to do is read uh, to you from some different translations the first 18 verses of Matthew chapter 6. And then we're going to go back and put them up on the screen one by one. I want you to hear them all in context and then we'll go back and begin to dissect them. Jesus starts, Matthew chapter 6. So be careful not to practice your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, they may applaud you, but your heavenly Father will not. So when you give to the needy, do not sound the trumpets as the hypocrites in the synagogues do and standing on the street corners to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward and they have received it in full. So you, when you give to the needy, do not even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. And then your father, who sees what is done in those secret places, well, he will reward you openly. 
And when you pray, well, don't make a show of it like those religious actors are doing. For they love to pray standing on the street corners and in the synagogues. And they love to do it so that they'll be seen of people to not be like them. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward and they have received their reward in full. But when you pray... Go into your room and close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in those secret places, well, he will reward you. And another thing about prayer. Don't keep going on and on as the, as the pagans do. And people who think they're going to be heard because of their many words. Let me let you in on something. Do you know that your heavenly father knows what you need even before you ask him? So when you pray, pray like this. Our father who makes his home in the heavens. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, Father. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but would you deliver us from the evil one? And then he continues, for if you forgive those uh, other people when they sin against you, well, guess what? Your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, well, your Heavenly Father will not forgive you. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they love to mark up their faces just to show people they are fasting. And I tell you again, they have received their reward and they have received it in full. But when you fast, clean up, watch your face, so that it will not be obvious to other people that you are fasting. Only to your Father who sees what is done in those secret places. And He will reward you. So let's go back. That's the first 18 verses. And let's begin to unpack what Jesus is saying there, starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness. Now, some of your versions are going to say your righteous deeds, your acts of righteousness, your, your service, even your good works. And when he says practice your really what is acts of righteousness, he's talking about all the things that you do when you're serving God. <laughs> All the things that we do when we're serving God, when we, whether it's working in Night to Shine or the food room or whether it's here serving on Sunday morning in the parking lot, whatever it is, whatever you call your acts of righteousness, the stuff that you do. Be careful not to do that stuff that you do in front of others to be seen by them. Well, if you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. And now he has connected Matthew chapter 5 with Matthew chapter 6 by telling us, well, that there is a reward but if you do the stuff that you do to be seen by other people, to be applauded by other people, well, there is no reward other than the reward you've already gotten. Well, when you put kind of Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 up along Matthew chapter 5 verse uh, 16, which is what we're going to do in a minute, it almost looks like Jesus is saying two different things. In Matthew chapter 5, 16, in fact, let's go ahead and put that up. He says, let your light shine. Now, who is he saying that to? He's saying that to the people that he has just said, well, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. People don't light a, a lamp and then hide it under a bushel. No, they put it on a lampstand so that it gives light to everyone that's in the house. He's saying that to all those people that he has said, when you live out the Beatitudes, when you are poor in spirit, when you are merciful, when you forgive, when you love your enemies, when you are like that, if that's the light you're living, then let your light shine before others so they can see your good deeds. But now we come to Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 and watch what he says. Be careful not to practice your good deeds before others. And in just the short of a little span of time, Jesus has gone from, looks like he's saying, shine your light, shine your light, to hide your light, hide your light, hide your light. To, so which is it? Is he, is he schizophrenic here? What's going on with what Jesus is saying here? Well, it all has to do with motives. I say that Jesus, once again, is really giving us more insight as we dive into this on what it means to have a righteousness, to do the things that we do, uh, and that has to go beyond what the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were doing. I say that because he's about to give us three other illustrations. The six illustrations he gave, again, in Matthew chapter 5, were based on what they had heard. You have heard that it is said, don't murder. You have heard that it is said, don't commit adultery. The three illustrations he is about to give them in Matthew 6 are not based on what they had heard. It's based on what they were seeing. 
what they were seeing the religious people of their day doing. And in all three illustrations, Jesus is going to point us back to a righteousness that comes from deep inside, not a service righteousness. And they will all deal not so much with what we do, but why we do it. Anyway, moving on. To see the why or the motive behind each of these, these are not complete quotations of the verse. Let me put the rest of it up there for you. In Matthew chapter 5, to the people who were living these beatitudes out in their lives, who were living as salt and light to the earth, he says, for you people, well, you should let your light shine before others. Why? So they can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And all of a sudden you realize that the motive for being the light of the world, the motive for being the salt of the earth is, is not you. <laughs> the motive is shining this big spotlight, not on my life, but on God's life. Now compare that to Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 where he says, Be careful not to practice your good deeds before others. This is what he says. To be seen by them. You see, Jesus knows there's always an inherent danger sometimes when you have people who are doing things. That, that there's a danger that you could begin to do things not because it's coming from the inside, but because you want people to see. So Matthew 5, yes, to those people who are pure in heart. Matthew chapter 5, to those people who have agendas that are true, where they're, they're, they're trying to live for God, they're making for peace in a world for war, they're hungry and they're thirsting after the things of God. They realize that without Jesus they're lost. Then yes, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You should let that light shine because that light's not about you. That light is about your Father in heaven. You're living to promote His kingdom. But those, uh, those other people, we get to Matthew 6. Jesus is saying, you need to realize something. There's a big difference in people whose hearts are pure. And people who are doing good for the kingdom of heaven. There is a difference between people who think this life is about their story. And people who realize that they have just been dropped in for a moment in time. To be a part of a much bigger story. And people who are doing good because they want something from the kingdoms of men. He says, well, they're living for their story. And this kingdom that I'm bringing in is about God's story. So Jesus is saying, check your motives. When your motive is to be seen. When your motive is to be Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> when your motive is for people to notice everything you've done. He says, be careful. Because there's an inherent danger that you will begin to think that what you've done made you right with God. And because of that, with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, he knew they were never going to accept him. They knew that they were counting on all of these acts of righteousness so they could look at how good they have been and never realize that they were only part of something that was much bigger than they are. And then Jesus gives three examples of these good works, these acts of righteousness, these giving, praying, and fasting. He says, when you do them, make sure that when you give and when you pray and when you fast, you do them for the right reasons. The question before his audience that day, and I think our day, is this. When you do these acts of righteousness, whose light are you shining? Whose kingdom are you trying to build? Why and with what motive? What's the heartbeat behind the reason you serve? So he says, Matthew 6, 1, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. That word to be seen, Greek word for that is right here. Uh, I will not attempt to pronounce it because my southern English will not allow that to take place. It would come out something that Siri couldn't even understand. But can you guess what English word we get from that word? Theater. That's right. It means to put on display. Let me read it another way, what Jesus is saying. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be put on the stage by them. To behold them. To look at them. To look upon them is really what that word means. It means that you are doing something to be noticed by other people. And if that's your motive, if that's the why behind what you're doing, then guess what? Then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And you will notice that Jesus isn't shy about telling us that there are rewards. Rewards on earth, rewards in heaven. you got to figure out which one you want. If you practice your good deeds before others so that they'll see them, he says, then your reward is the reward of people. 
In fact, he will say, if that's the reward you want on earth, then that's the only reward you'll get. And this principle will play out in all three illustrations he gives of giving, praying, and fasting. But we need to know that those are only three illustrations that are illustrating a much broader principle. And the principle is this, anything that we do that we bring before God. Well, his first illustration is giving. So he says this. So when you give, I want you to notice, first of all, he assumes that God followers will be givers. His point is not discussing whether we are to give or whether we're not to give. He assumes that God's people are people who are givers. He says, so when you give to the needy, and then he begins to tell us how to do it. He says, do not announce it with trumpets. (laughs) Don't call attention to it. Don't make a show of it. Don't do all of those things. And, and there's even a parable that uh, Jesus talks about where it's a story that he tells. He says uh, that when the, the, later on in the book of Matthew, that when the religious leaders were coming and they were giving their, their alms and they were giving their, their offerings, that they would actually, you know, kind of cash in their, their dollar bills and they would get their coins and they would put them in the, in the, the offering so that they would make noises and that, so that people could see how much they were giving. And the people in Jesus' audience who were doing that, they would have known who they they are. He says, so when you give to the needy, speaking of his followers, don't announce it with trumpets. Watch what he says, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Now that sounds kind of harsh for Jesus to say, doesn't it? As the hypocrites do. If somebody called you a hypocrite, well, you'd probably take offense at that, wouldn't you? And, and, and that's because when we hear hypocrite, we, we kind of, I don't know that it means any, a lot different than, uh, than, than what they mean it back there, but it. Uh, the, the word kind of has a different connotation. In our day and age, it means somebody who says one thing and does another. So when you say it, it's kind of offensive to people. But that's kind of really what it is. But in their day and age, when they saw that word hypocrite, you know what they would see? They would see the word actor or actress. It really meant to wear a mask, to put something on the stage. So when they saw that, they're not really thinking hypocrite the way we think of hypocrite. They are thinking, well, do not announce it with trumpets as the... Actors, as the religious actors. That's why in Eugene Peterson's translation of the message, he calls it religious actors. Don't do it as the religious actors do. He said, he goes, they're, they're only doing it to make a show. Don't announce it. They think, they want you to think they're doing something for the kingdom of heaven, but it's really for the kingdom of them. He says, they do it. They wear this mask so that they'll be honored by others. So that others will say, wow, what a good person he is. Wow, what a great giver they are. They do something on the outside to make you think they are something on the inside. And he goes, in reality, they're like an actor who is wearing a mask. They do it so that people will know. They do it to get their name on a plaque. They do it to get their name on a building. They do it to get the praises of people. They do it to be recognized by people because they are at their core not about building the kingdom of heaven. They are about building the kingdom of them. And Jesus is not so in my kingdom. And I tell you the truth. Truly. They have received their reward in full. Nothing else. If the praises of men is what they wanted. Then the praises of men is what they got. And there is nothing on the other side of eternity coming from them. In fact, that word there, reward in full, it comes from an accounting term that was used when someone owed you for something you had done for them. And then when they paid you, you would stamp their bill, paid in full. And Jesus is saying, if you're doing these things to be seen of other people, if you're doing these things to get something personally for yourself, then I want you to know something. Before you ever get to the pearly gates... (laughs) Before you ever get into the kingdom of God, that account has been settled. It's been paid in full. So enjoy the plaque. Enjoy the building. Enjoy the applause of men. Enjoy when they come into the room and they clap. Because if that's the reward you wanted, if that's the reward you were after, then that's the only reward you'll get. His next illustration was prayer. And he says this. And when you pray, again, notice, he assumes that God's people will be people who pray. The question is not, will we pray? The question, and when we pray, 
Well, not be like those. Do not be like those religious actors. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. And again, in in following the uh, verses, the chapters in the book of Matthew, he'll tell a story about two people who went up in the temple and they were going to pray. One was a Pharisee, one was a teacher of the law, and one was a tax collector, the, the lowest of the low, the guy on the other end. And he says, the religious leader who was there, when he goes up to the temple to pray, he looks and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not other people. God, thank you I'm not like them. I have not done that, and I've not done that. Ooh, and I have certainly not done that. I have not been there, at least not today or yesterday or last week. He says, I thank you that I am not like other people. Then he goes to the tax collector, and he says, but the tax collector came, and he beat his breast. And he said, God, I am a sinner. I have done you wrong. I have done the world wrong. Would you show mercy on me? They would have known well who Jesus was talking about. These religious actors, they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners. They're doing it to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, if that's the reward they want, and that's the only reward they'll get, their debt is paid in full. Notice the very same structure that is there. What's your motive? What is the why behind you pray, your prayers? Do you pray so that others will see and say, oh, what beautiful words. Oh, how they pray. In fact, as we'll look next week and as we dive into the Lord's Prayer next week, you'll find a principle that is playing out through all of this. Jesus says, so when you pray, pray like this. Our Father who makes us home in the heavens, hallowed be your name. And then here it comes, your kingdom come. Not my kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on this earth. And maybe the question for each of us is this. What would it look like if not only our prayer, what we hear, is Father, your kingdom come. What would it look like as we left here if all of our lives were about making that happen? Would this afternoon look any different if we left here determined to bring the kingdom of God to earth? Would this week look any different for us? Instead of thinking of all the things that that we have and all the things going on in our lives, if we thought, what would it look like if the kingdom, if I was a part of bringing the kingdom to earth, if I realized that I am not here for my story, that I have been here to be a part of a much bigger story. And if you pray so that others will see, so that your kingdom is advanced, he says, we'll enjoy it while it lasts. The last one is about fasting. He says, when you fast, and notice again, he doesn't, he, he doesn't say if you fast. He assumes that God's people will fast. Let me give, when you, when you hear fasting, I bet most of you, how many of you think of food? In this getting 12 o'clock already, I'm already thinking of food. It's hard to think of fasting right here. When you think of fasting, think of this. Think of giving up something temporary for something eternal. Giving up something temporary for something eternal. And notice he says, he says, I'm just assuming God's people are going to do that. I'm assuming that God's people are going to be people who give up something temporary for something eternal. And when you do that, though, do not look somber. Oh, I gave up my cable TV this week. Oh, I gave up my car this week. I gave it to Ethel. She didn't have one. (laughs) Do not look somber as the religious actors do. They just figure their faces and they do it to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. All three times, whether giving, praying, or fasting, or whatever act of righteousness that you want to put there, he says, if you do it for what you get here, then there is no reward there. And in all three instances, I want you to see something. It is not wrong to be seen giving. It is wrong to give to be seen. It is not wrong to be seen praying. If it is, Jesus is about to break his own law because he is about to give the model prayer in front of his very disciples in this crowd that's that's coming in front of him. It is wrong to pray in order to be seen. And it is not wrong to be seen fasting, to be seen giving up something temporary for something internal. It is wrong to fast in order to be seen. Do you see the difference there? And Jesus is saying to his followers, he says, you guys are being taught to follow God in such a way that only touches the surface. You religious leaders, you hear what they say, but I say... 
You see how they act. But I say, and it never reaches the heart. What I would like for you to do is this. I would like for you to stop thinking and religious leaders. I would like you to stop teaching that righteousness is a bunch of rules you can follow. And a bunch of actions you can do when your heart has not been surrendered to God. So the question becomes, then Jesus, how do I respond? How do I live out? When I do these works of service, and we do them. I mean, we have kind of built a whole church on doing works and and deeds of, of righteousness for our community. So how does he say to do those? Well, let me show you what he says. And in reality, I think he's talking more individually here. But I think we can apply it collectively as well. And uh, I don't really think it needs a lot of commentary for me. So I'm just going to read you the words of Jesus. So when you give individually, collectively... When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in those secret places, well, He will reward you. And any reward He can give is greater than anything you can get here. And when you pray, we'll go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. And again, you can see He's talking individual prayer here. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And regarding fasting, when you fast... Put all on your head and watch your face. So that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting. But only to your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what is done in the secret places. He will reward you. And the message of Jesus is this. If on earth we find ourselves living for the kingdom of heaven. Then we should be doing it for a reward far greater than anything we would ever get on earth. Far greater than the praise of men. Far greater than money or power or fame. Far greater than our name on any plaque or any building. They may put your name on a plaque or they may put your name on a building. Just make sure you didn't do it to get that. Make sure you did it because it came from a place of love for the people in your life and the people that God made. When you, when you pray, they, they may say, and I've said to people before, wow, that was a beautiful prayer. I've hugged people on our staff, and there's some people on our staff who can pray some of the most beautiful prayers. The difference is this. Are they praying so that I'll tell them they prayed a beautiful prayer? Or are they praying it because they're in love with Jesus Christ? And they're so thankful for what he's done that this is natural outflow of this private life lived for God. And they may see you fast. They may see you give up something temporary for something eternal. Just make sure you didn't do it so they would see it. Because the kingdom of heaven is so much greater than the applause of men. The kingdom of heaven is so much higher than any kingdom you could build on this earth. So the deep question I think that each of us ask, must ask in our lives, whether it's individually or whether it's even as a collective body of people, when we do the things that we do, do we do it to make our name known? Or we do it to make His name known? Do we do it because we realize that for a time and a place that we have been born into, that we have been dropped into this space in eternity, that there was a lot going on over here, <laughs> going to be a lot going on when I'm gone for this time, in this place, whose name am I living to be made known? Many of you will know the name John the Baptist. He is more accurately, in, in my opinion, called John the Baptizer because it was describing what he was doing. He's a pretty famous guy in the New Testament. He was the cousin of Jesus. And the Apostle John tells us that John the Baptist was sent to be the forerunner of Jesus. Now, a forerunner in the days of kings and queens and princesses and, and kingdoms and all of that. A forerunner is someone who would go before the king. That when the king had decided to visit a city and the king had decided to visit a country and the king had decided to visit a people that they would send a forerunner. The forerunner might go a week before. He might go a month before. He might go a year before. And his message is this. Prepare the way for the king. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. You need to get ready because the king is coming. If you've ever watched Cinderella, you've seen it in there where the little mouse comes into the city and unscrolls the thing and says, the king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. Well, all of that's going on 
on. And it's kind of that idea when, when the Apostle John tells us that that was the job of John the Baptist. He was there to proclaim. He was there to tell the people there is a king coming. Well, because of that, because they were looking for a king, John the Baptist got really famous. I mean, he was so famous that people are, are looking at him and they're saying, you're the man, John the Baptist. Both Matthew and Mark tell us that there were people from all over coming to John the Baptist to listen to him, to learn from him, to see what in the world's going on. And there were people even coming to be baptized by them, by the thousands. He was the one. Everybody wanted something to do with John the Baptist. That is, until this day. When John the Baptist is baptizing people and he looks up off in the distance and he sees someone coming and he realizes it's his cousin Jesus. And he looks to this crowd and he says, Behold, the word there is look. I know you've been looking at me. I know all eyes are on me. I know that a lot of you think this is about my story and what I'm doing, but I'm telling you something. I was only sent to point his name is Jesus. And he is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And if you read throughout the story, John, Jesus comes on down and Jesus says, John, I want you to baptize me. And John is like, no, no, I can't do it. I, I, can't, even, I can't even bend down and untie your sandals. And Jesus says, yeah, you can. And they go out in the water and John the Baptist baptizes Jesus and, and, and Jesus goes on his way. And a few chapters later, in John chapter 3, some of the people who have been following John, they come up to John. And they look at him and they say, you know, John, you baptized Jesus. I mean, you are important. You are the man. You, you're a big thing. You baptized this guy. But look, he's now baptizing people. And all these people that were following you, well, look, they're following him now. What are you going to do, John? Implication being, you're going to lose your followers. These people, that you, you're, you're not going to be as popular anymore. You're not going to be the man anymore if you continue to let this happen. What do you think John the baptizer's response was? I'm glad they record it for us. In John 3 verse 30, he must become greater and I must become less. He must become greater and I must become less. And maybe the question that Jesus was asking them on that day so long ago, and maybe the question he's asking each of us today is this. Tom, fill in your name there. Are you willing to be forgotten if the one you are giving to, if the one you are praying to, if the one you are fasting to, Tom, are you willing to be forgotten if that one's name would be remembered? The answer to that question, I think Jesus says, might just show whose kingdom you're living for. You see, we do acts of righteousness. We do good deeds. And we do them so that the name of Jesus will be lifted up. So that the name of Jesus will become famous. So that the name of Jesus will be remembered long after I'm gone. And maybe the message of John and Matthew and this sermon that he's doing, especially these 18 verses, is this. Whose story are you living for? Do you realize that your life, just this segment for this moment, for this 20, 30, 40, 70, 90 years that you have been dropped in on planet earth and that you are part of a much bigger story than just the story of you. Live that story. And that's why he will teach them to pray. Your kingdom come, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. And that's where we'll pick up next week in this crazy upside down kingdom that Jesus invites us to be a part of Father I thank you for again challenging and I pray Father that we will be a people who realize that we are only part of a much bigger story and that we rejoice that we are allowed to play a part in the story of God Father may we be a people 
who give, who fast, who pray, who serve, who do all the things that we do so that your name will be lifted up, so that you will become famous, so that your name will be remembered long after my name has been forgotten. I ask it in the name and the power of Jesus. And the whole church at Northfield said, Amen.